morning. Great to see you. All right, I'm going to put up a picture in just a second. And when I do, I want you to shout out what it is, if you recognize it, okay? If you recognize this, I'll give you a hint. It is a old school, I don't know, nursery rhyme, fairy tale, something like that, okay? So just to kind of put it in context. See if you can be the first one to shout it out. You ready? Three, two, one. Who is it? Yes, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Who remembers that story? Do they even tell this story anymore? Because it used to be a classic. It used to be something we would all know about, right? It was one of those things like you would grow up. It was kind of in the lexicon. Everybody understood it. But I don't think we've looked at this, and I don't know if the younger generation is aware of what this is. Because honestly, I don't even know what the moral of this story is. (laughs) When you look at this bizarre 19th century fairy tale, think about this. Goldilocks shows up. She's apparently guilty of home invasion, burglary, destruction of property. If you're, if you're not familiar with the story, here's what happens. Goldilocks enters a house. There's three bears living there, which is kind of weird by itself. There's these three bears. They're in this home. She shows up uninvited. Catch that. Uninvited. Lets herself in. I don't know if it's breaking and entering or if it's just entering. But she sees three heaping bowls of what? Porridge, mmm, yummy porridge. I don't even know what that is, right? So they're eating this porridge. She, she goes to the first one, and it's too hot. Then she goes to the next bowl, and it's too cold. Oh, but that third bowl, say it with me, is just right. Oh, look at you. Yes, you know your stories. She's not done. She turns, she sees three chairs. She's like, oh, three beautiful chairs. She goes to one, sits in it. It's not right. She goes to another one. It's not right. But she goes and finds a third one, and it is, say it again, just right. And then she breaks it, right? Okay, so she, she is on a roll. Right now, so far, we've got breaking and entering, we've got larceny and burglary, and now we've got destruction of property. Evidently, she's exhausted from her crime spree. So she heads upstairs and does what everybody does, right? You look for a stranger's bed to make yourself comfortable. So she goes into this bed. Now, think about this. Isn't that weird? She goes upstairs. She sees three beds. And one is too soft. One is too hard. Oh, but that third one is just right. Oh, you guys are, this is awesome, right? She goes, she makes herself at home in a stranger's bed, thinks nothing of it. She's so content, she falls asleep, literally in a stranger's bed. The three bears come home. They go upstairs. They discover the damage, and much to our great disappointment, there's no confrontation. There's no justice. The little felon escapes. She's gone. Where is the justice in this, in this whole story here? But we're left with something that I want to leap off of today. There is a two-word motto that we have been saying all morning. You've been getting it. You know it. You're ahead of me. And it is a worthy goal of how we should be doing life. And that is living life just right in what's called the sweet spot. Not too little, not too much, but just right. How awesome would it be if life was that way, if we could live in that perfect zone? Where there wasn't, you know, too much stress, but there wasn't too little. You know, the demands of work weren't too bad, they weren't too little, they weren't too much. Our emotions, our relationships, what if we enjoyed just the right amount of of romance? What if we enjoyed just the right amount of risk versus caution? Whether it's our investment portfolio, or whether it's the things we allow our kids to do. Milo, get out of that tree. Whether we go through daily life fearful or reckless. What do we do? Like, just the right amount. In other words, balance. Or, as the Bible calls it, godly contentment. Y'all, that is a word we don't hear much anymore. Contentment. Think how much we complain. Think how much we, as as the body of Christ, as believers, most of us in this room probably know the Lord. Hopefully, if you're listening online, maybe you're you're finding out what is this, this about, meaning to follow Jesus. What does that look like? Well, the first thing should be a mark of a life of godly contentment, a word of balance, living life in God's sweet spot. Now, if you're not sure about sweet spots, anybody play tennis? Anybody? Nobody plays tennis? Okay, well, let me educate you, because I... Tracy plays tennis. Susan, you play tennis? You won't raise your hand, but I know you do. Susan's going to come up and demonstrate a forehand. (laughs) The tennis racket is known for having a sweet spot. And tennis players will tell you that it is this perfect, beautiful spot where the ball hits in this little zone where it launches off the racket with incredible velocity, accuracy, but above all, no vibration. 
you could even hear it. You could hear it when they're doing these circles. When it just launches, it's like, fuck. And it's like, it races down the baseline for a winner. And it's incredible. You can't do anything about it. Manufacturers know this. In fact, they're even marketing it. Like, oh, this sweet spot, my sweet spot's better than yours. 12% more, 70%, oh, 50%. It's like, they're marketing to that. When you look at this in life, career counselors would come and say, your sweet spot is to go find a job that you do what you love and you love what you do. And hopefully you get paid well for it. Well, that's pretty nice. Does that lead to contentment? Does that lead to purpose and living life with passion? See, when you look at this in the same way, God wants you to operate in a place where you are living with purpose and not random futility, where you have clarity, you know, not chaos, where you know why you do what you do, where you know why you believe what you say you believe. And not only that, but you can Share that with others. And you can do it in a way that is full of truth, grace, and love. We're not supposed to be burning the candle at both ends. We're not supposed to be way over here on one of these extremes on just too little or too much. We're not supposed to be running the rat race. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could find that place where you are not always keeping up with the Joneses? You're not always going further and further into debt, trying to buy bigger and better things or the newest gadget. But at the same time, you're not over here just being lazy, living in a van down by the river. It's one of those middle grounds, these sweet spots, life in balance, life with godly contentment, which brings us today to the prayer of Agur. Oh, yes, the prayer of Agur. You know it. You love it. You had your quiet time in it. This is we Don't look like you know what I'm talking about. Nobody knows who Agur is. And that's what I love. I love to dive into these unique things, these weird things. All summer long, it's going to get weird. We're going to have a good time right? Because I love to take these breaks. We're going to dive into the Psalms. We're going to have some strange stuff happening. Agur is talking about finding God's sweet spot. The prayer of Agur is just three short verses. It's found in verse 7, 8, and 9 of chapter 30. You can open your Bible there and go ahead and find it, but don't read it. Don't, in fact, we're not even going to read it today. We're going to look at the entire chapter 30 except for the prayer because I'm saving that for next week. It is so good. Three short verses, almost like a formula of how to live life in God's sweet spot, a, a life that is just right. All right, so what do we know about Agur? Well, nothing. <laughs> Hardly anything, right? When you look at the Psalms or, or the Proverbs, we know that probably 29 of them were written by Solomon. If he didn't write them, he compiled them. Then there's Proverbs 31, which is, you know, pretty famous. We know it. It's the wife of noble character. She's precious and far more worth than rubies. And her children rise up and call her blessed. And her husband's known in the city. It's all that beautiful imagery and those lofty goals. But there's a chapter right before that that we skip, and that's Proverbs 30. And if you open that verse, it says he's a son of Jacob. And that's it. That's all we know. I mean, it's like, like a mystery novel. Like, it just sets a thing, and then he disappears. He shows up in this one little chapter, and it is incredible. And I want to warn you, before we dive in, we're going to go verse by verse on this. Agur's writing is kind of different. It's not abrasive, but it is a little, he's almost like a stand-up comedian who uh, is good at observational humor. You know what I'm talking about? Like a Nate Bargatze or a, a Seinfeld or a George Costanza. I can almost picture Agur sitting across from one of those comedians at the diner saying, what's the deal? You ever notice Aquaman? Like, can he get out of the water? You know, it's just like weird stuff. Like, where did that come from? That's what I think of an Agur. He's not sarcastic, but he does kind of have a little attitude. <laughs> and I like it. And I like it because he is a regular guy. Agur is this guy who shows up, he drops this truth bomb, all of chapter 30, and then he disappears. And that's all we have. But that's all we need because his wisdom made it into God's book. And that's a great reminder for all of us. Let's just park there. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be rich to be my girl. You don't have to be famous or nothing to be impactful for the kingdom. You don't have to, to, to make a difference. You could be just a regular normal Joe. And I like that because I like normal guys. See, if you were to compare yourself to Moses or Ruth or Abraham, I kind of feel like, oh, wow, <laughs> please don't. Don't compare me to that. I don't measure up to that. I mean, these, these great spiritual giants, I like regular folk. These people who show up for a little bit, they drop their truth grenade for a verse or two, and then they're gone. Because I can identify, I can relate. For example, take Simeon, one of my favorite. 
We have this old prophet. He barely shows up in Luke chapter 2, like for a tiny bit. He gets to hold and meet Mary and Joseph and hold the infant Jesus in his arms. He holds him up, predicts this is going to be the light of the world. Oh, by the way, he's going to cause the rise and fall of many. Here's your baby. And then he disappears. <laughs> That's it. That's what, he's gone. What about this name? You recognize Jochebed? No, you don't. You don't recognize it anymore. You recognize Agur. Because even I had to look up how to pronounce it. You know who Jochebed is? This is the mother of Aaron and Miriam. Oh, and a little insignificant guy named Moses. You know the story. Three months old, puts him in a reed basket, sends him down the Nile, rescues him from the Egyptian death squads. That one act did nothing less than launch biblical history. Moses, the writer of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the Jewish Bible, everything all goes back to Moses. Yet her name appears twice in the Bible. Think about that. Just a nobody who showed up and did something great for God, living life in the sweet spot. What about the thief on the cross? I love it. We don't even know his name. Yet he was broken, looks at Jesus. He recognized who Jesus was enough to say, remember me. And Jesus looks at him and says his amazing words. He says, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Think about that. In an instant, his zip code forever was changed. And then he disappears. So I can identify with Simeon and Jochebed, the thief on the cross, and Agur. Regular people who made a difference. Why? Because they found their purpose. And so can we. And that leads us to our first takeaway this morning. Seek God's purpose. Seek his purpose. Not your purpose. Not my purpose. Not your pastor's purpose. None of us, we may not be famous. We may not be wealthy. We may not be rulers of mighty nations like we read about. But we can all make a difference. So he has these brief introductions. Agar begins. He tells him, you know, hey, son of Jacob. And he goes through. And then he launches in in verse 1, and he does something I totally love and respect. He admits his limitations, and he is super blunt about it. Check it out with me. In the NLT, starting in verse 1, chapter 30, he says, I am weary, O God. I am weary and worn out. I am too stupid to be human. <laughs> All right, we got to stop there. All right? That's just awesome. Be honest. Put that on your resume. Can you imagine showing up to work like, I'm tired, I'm worn out, and by the way, I'm stupid. You want to hire me? <laughs> oh, but wait, he's not done. I lack common sense. I forgot to add that to my resume. I have not mastered human wisdom, and I'm pretty sure I don't even know the Holy One. This is his opening salvo. Are you still with him? Because I love it. I love his humility. It is so refreshing to me. I love his honesty. He admits he's frail. He's tired, maybe a little uneducated. Perhaps a little brutish and beastly and bulbous. He's, he's this, this strange man. and He fully admits he's not mastered human wisdom. He has not got a grasp of knowledge of the Holy One. He knows full well that if he were to truly know the creator of the universe, if he revealed himself in all his glory, all his splendor, all his radiance, it would blow his mind. And it would blow ours. It should. We couldn't handle it. Because God is too awesome. He is too big to fully comprehend this side of heaven. He can't be put in our little box. In fact, that's your next takeaway. Write that down. Appreciate God's undefinability. Never put God in a box. He is beyond our imagination, our comprehension. Resist the urge to define the undefinable. He can't be put in a box. Nobody puts baby in a corner. You can't use finite logic and define the infinite. Then, moving along, look at verse 4. Suddenly, Agar starts gaining his confidence. Check out what he does. He starts asking some awesome, que deep questions. Questions we all should be asking. Look at verse 4. He says, who but God goes up to heaven and comes back down? Who holds the wind in his fists? Who wraps the oceans up in his cloak? Who has created the whole wide world? What's his name? Hey, what's his son's name? Oh, that's a bombshell, by the way. We'll get to that. Tell me if you know. So you see what he does here? He asks six questions. Boom, boom, boom. Who's visited heaven? Who gathers the wind? Who controls the seas? Who made the earth? What's his name? And what's the name of his son? And then, I love Agar. He boldly demands an answer. He says, tell me if you know. If you're using the NIV, yours says, surely you know. I love it. It's like so in your face. I love his confidence. It's the same confidence that we get from Psalm 19.1 where he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
Agar is confirming what anyone who is honest and fairly looking at this, anyone would recognize that God is the creator of the wind, the seas, the earth itself. It all testifies to knowledge of the Holy One, to the creator. Surely you know, he says. Think about it. Who has a watch? You got a watch? You got a watch. Is this one of these? Ooh, look at it. Fancy. Hold that up. This watch is so intricate, so designed with all kinds of doodads and gadgets and whiz-bangs and poppers and snappers. There's so much going on in here. This did not happen by random chance. A watch implies a watchmaker. And Agar is saying a world such as as complex as this implies a world maker. That's a creator. That is a God. And if he could show up in our day to day, I think he would say, guys, if you can't see with all honesty that a creation implies a creator, then you are too distracted with your own personal world to notice the real world. You are too distracted by your accomplishments, your agenda, to notice God's agenda. What a beautiful message for us in 2021. This is written 3,000 years ago. And Agar is taking it from our headlines. So the first four questions talk about the creator. But the next one gets a little deeper. He says, what's his name? All right, I'm going to go deep here. Next 30, 40 seconds, you hang with me on this. This is written roughly in the middle of the Old Testament period, okay? For the timeline, about 3,000 years ago. To answer that question would have been okay and probably doable for a majority of the Hebrew people because God at this point had revealed his own name a few different times. Not much, but he had revealed so far that he's Yahweh Elohim. He has revealed at this point that he's El Elyon and Adonai and El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh, and that's about it. At this point in history, Agar goes on and says something else. It's his next question that is so stinking loaded, it blew my mind when I grasped this. He says, hey, what's the name of his son? Well, the Hebrews at that point said, wait, what? Think about this. Y'all, we, we miss this. They're sitting there going, Agar's prophesying. Everything he's saying we're along with, we, we get it. And all of a sudden he starts talking about God's having a son. What bizarre topic is this? Y'all, we miss this. This is your hidden gem. Agar was writing this a thousand years before the birth of Christ. A thousand years. So at this point, prophecy about the Messiah is accepted. The Hebrews get that. They're into that. That's a focus of the Hebrew people. It's not a big deal. It still is. But before Agar, there was barely a hint in any of the ancient writings that the Messiah would also be the Son of God. We don't know that because we always see it together. They didn't have that. They're looking, y'all, this is the, one of the first times. It was just a hit, just little trickles, and they didn't put it together. So when Agar is saying, hey, what's the name of God's son? Y'all, this is huge. They're like, what are you talking about? This is like asking that kind of question. This points in history, when he's doing this, this shows Agar is a true prophet of God. This is incredible. This should blow our minds. He is foretelling something that it, it's like the fog has been in front of their eyes. It's slowly, it's lifting. Like, okay, we know the Messiah is coming. He's going to be directly related. He's going to be the son of God. How's that going to work? What's it? I'm almost hearing whispers of a third part of this Godhead, like a trinity, like a Holy Spirit, but he only comes and lands on people for a little bit, and he disappears. We have the Holy Spirit that can live within us to take up residence. Y'all, this, this should cause us to marvel, and that's your next point. Marvel at God's plan. This is incredible. When you look back at his timeline and you see what he's done, it is mind-blowing. We have the benefit of looking back and seeing how the Old Testament now clearly points to Jesus, clearly points to the revealing of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Paraclete. He clear, we see that they didn't have that. So when Agar shows up, he starts dropping these truth bombs. People are like, what is he going? Where is this headed? It should cause us to marvel. We are living in the sweet spot between the first and second coming of the Lord. This little window where we get to tell people about Christ and how knowing him allows the Holy Spirit to live. Y'all, this should cause us to marvel with awestruck wonder. So we've just met Agar. We've seen his humility. We've seen his audacious statements about God and God's son. And then he takes a breath. And before his short prayer, he does something I love. He does something so ironic, so paradoxical, some of us have missed it. He endorses scripture. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, some of you won't get this. Some of you will. He says, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. Do not add to his words, or he may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. Did you catch it? Look, look, look. 
Agur provides an ironic twist here, okay? It's right here in the book of Proverbs. He says, every word of God proves true, all right? Every word of God's flawless, your translation might say. Then he says, so don't add to his words. I love what he just, he's so bold. What he's doing, he's calling it out, this paradox here. Agur warns us not to add to God's words while adding to God's words. Isn't that audacious? Isn't that bold? Isn't that great? This chapter written by Agur ends up being endorsed by God. It is in the Bible. How is that possible? How is he doing what he's supposed to not do? This is so cool. This is why I love God's word. It's so amazing. This is yet again a perfect reminder that the Bible may have been written down by man, but it is inspired by God. It is not a normal book. It is our authority. The writers were inspired in the moment by the Holy Spirit. So when Agur correctly wrote these words, he was at that very moment speaking for God. Well, that's huge. For extra clarity, look at 2 Peter. He talks about this. He says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. Oh, no. Those prophets were moved by who? The Holy Spirit, and they spoke for who? From God. In other words, God's inspired word can, does, and absolutely should stand on its own. But if we don't know it, we cannot stand on it. Biblical illiteracy, even in the church, has never been higher. Yet we've had more access to versions of this great book than any generation in history. This is our foundation. This is it. Agur is saying this is from God. Our perspective must be anchored in Scripture. This is what gives us our heavenly perspective. When we look around at this world and they are losing their minds. You know what I'm talking about? You just look around, you scratch your head, and you think, what is going on? Right is being called wrong. Wrong is now being right. Some things are being celebrated. Things are being redefined that God has clearly defined, and no one seems to have a problem with it. No one sees it go, well, I think I read somewhere that God had an opinion on that. Well, God's opinion doesn't matter. You know what matters? Your feelings. <laughs> well, I don't like that, Pastor. That hurts my feelings. Yeah, exactly. It does. I need a drink. Man. Drink of water. Let me clarify. Those watching at home, water. We're so wrapped up in me, myself, and I, and what I want, what I think. That hurts my feelings. I don't think that's politically correct. I don't care. I want to be biblically correct. And so should you. So should any follower. I don't mean hate people. I don't mean be a jerk. I do mean be bold and stand for truth, not be a coward. See, we say we're all in, and we make him Lord of all. He needs to be Lord of all. Or is he Lord at all? See, if we, if we just water stuff down and we come back, we're like, well, let's just, you know, you just do what you feel is right. And then we'll, no, well, that's not what Jesus said. Yeah, the devil would love nothing more than for us to have a distorted perspective and to ignore God's truth. Do you know that? Do you know how easy it is to have your perspective distorted today? The enemy can, you don't believe me? Let me show you something. Check this out right here. Look at this perspective. Oh, my goodness. So brave. Or shall we say yes, huh, huh? So foolish, right? We look at this, we think, this is, she's so brave. How could she do this? This is wonderful. No, she's not. If you had the right perspective, you would see she's a few feet off the ground. These rocks like this, they're all over the world. You could get, as long as you get the right perspective, huh, Instagram people, right? Put that filter on. You get this beautiful shot, and there are people who line up for hours to pose and do this. It's fake. We've been manipulated. That previous picture, like, what? Who would do that? We think that's, you know, how, how about someone who says, look at this next one. Oh, how awful. This dog attacking this helpless, defenseless lamb. When if you have the proper perspective, you can see he's actually helping this lamb. He is rescuing a, a lamb from drowning. It's all about perspective. And if we anchor ours to his word, then we will always have his standards. We will always know his truth. We will know what our purpose is, which leads us to our next takeaway. Affirm God's authority. Whew, we need to write that down today, church. Affirm God's authority. Notice it doesn't say affirm my authority. Affirm your authority. Affirm the pastor's authority. 
Trusting in the Bible as the foundation is the core. It is the starting point of everything. We must align ourselves with God's word. So after affirming God's word, Agur's next three verses in Proverbs 30 are the prayer of Agur. Here we are. This is it. And don't read it. Don't read, look up. Don't, don't, some of you, don't read it. We're saving it. Okay, we're going to come back to that. We're going to, in fact, that's all of next week. I, wanna, I have a challenge for you. And I caught some of you, okay? Then we're going to see all about living in God's sweet spot. So come back next week to hear about this. He skips over the prayer, okay? And Agur is now about a third of the way through roughly his divine chapter here. From here on out, he starts throwing out truth bombs left and right. And he starts giving these lists, things we should and shouldn't do, things we should avoid, different things like we shouldn't slander our coworkers, we shouldn't dishonor our parents, we shouldn't judge others while judging and justifying our own sin and our own shortcomings. We shouldn't look down on those who are different or less fortunate. And then he finishes Proverbs 30 with five lists, and we're going to run through all five of them, okay? And it sounds like, this is that part where it gets like the comedian. You're going to see like a Nate Bargatze standing up here in observational humor going, hey, you ever notice something, or did you ever think about this, or how, do you wonder about this? List number one begins in verse 15. Check it out with me, okay? He says this, there's three things that are never satisfied. Nope, I meant four. Four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the thirsty desert, and the blazing fire. What's Acre talking about? He wants us to know this world is broken. This world, as it currently is, will never satisfy. If you've lived long at all, you know there's truth here. That there is an ache. There is a void in our heart longing for something perfect. Y'all, we had that. We had our chance at paradise. We see that in the Garden of Eden. But now, because of sin, we are living in a fallen world. Not forever. We know the new heavens and the new earth. We know what's coming. But until that time, we are living in struggles and we have tribulations. Can I get an amen? That's the way it is. Look at the first one, the grave. Let's just go there. Death is unavoidable. Unless Jesus comes back first. I always got to have hope. You know me. I'm happy, clappy, Maddie. I want hope. Death is inevitable, but if the Lord returns first, we don't even taste that. May we be like Elijah and Enoch who are translated. This is a spiritual truth here, okay? We have only so much time, people. Only so much time that we can share with others the mission of the church, that you and I need a Savior, and his name is Yeshua. It is Jesus the Christ, and our job is to tell others about him. We only have so much time, and then eternity awaits. Look at the next one. He talks about a woman who can't bear children. Whew! This is an emotional truth. This is deep. We've all known people, great couples, who are aching to have children of their own like that. And we see the pain and the heavy emotional burden that that naturally is. Our job now is to walk beside them, to love them, and to come alongside them and minister to hurting people. Look at the third one, a thirsty land. This is a physical truth, all right? So we got a spiritual truth, an emotional truth. Now he's dropping a physical truth bomb. We see this back in middle school science class. We learn about water and rain, and the underground cisterns, and rivers, and oceans, and clouds, and how they all play their part. Again, a clear example of God's beautiful, organized creation. A watch implies a watchmaker. This incredible, complex stuff implies a world maker. Fire. He talks about fire, the last item on this first list. Another physical reminder, God's power, his provision. Think about it. It gives us light, cooks our food, gives us warmth. But buddy, when it's out of control, it can destroy. I'll never forget sitting around a campfire. Oh, but I'm doing those s'mores, right? I'm a little younger than Milo, and I'm bouncing it on that little coat hanger. Got the, I left it in too long, and now the marshmallow catches on fire. I'm like, oh, look at this. I'm talking to my brothers. And I'm, I'm so, look how, let's see how far we can get this to go. And that flaming, gooey, sticky marshmallow goes up, whoo, and lands on my bare thigh. Thank you. Where was that sympathy the night it happened? My family looked at me like I was an idiot. Well, I was. It lands on my leg, but it's on fire, and it's gooey. Mar I couldn't get it off. I set a world land speed record that day, running in circles. Because it hurt. I know, ah, I'm on fire, I'm on fire, my brother. You are not on fire, Ricky Bobby. Well, in that moment, it felt like I was on fire. 
that marshmallow, fire, when it, it can be so great, but it's so destructive. And Ager's noticing all these things. Look what he does next. Here's another quirky list. I call this one the amazing enigmas. Look at verse 18. There's three things that amaze me. Nope, four. I love this. This is his way he does this. Four things that I don't understand. How an eagle glides through the sky, how a snake slithers on a rock, how a ship navigates the ocean, oh, and how a man loves a woman. I love it. You must say it with a French accent here. Edgar's second list right here confirms what we already know, <laughs> that love and women are a mystery. There are things that are simply beyond our comprehension. And I'm not being sarcastic, just it's hitting me funny right now, and it didn't all week long when I was preparing this. This is the way it should be. Things can exist beyond our finite mind. You know that? Hopefully we're not so prideful. We're not so arrogant that we think we have to have God all figured out. I prefer a God who gets things better than I do. I prefer a God who can handle things and have a better grasp, a grasp on things than I do and knows how things work because I'm probably going to get it wrong. And he gives four examples of how the universe works in ways we may not fully understand. How an eagle flies, how a snake moves on a rock. It's freaky. We got them all over our backyard. How boats stay afloat and cross the seas. And then number four, oh yes, the love of a woman. How God has designed man and woman. The original design of the Garden of Eden, attraction, love, romance, sex, procreation. So we could fulfill his mandate. Don't forget his original mandate. Come together, become one flesh, subdue the planet, and populate it. That is your mandate. It's beautiful. It's his plan, by the way. Man didn't make it up from the beginning. And with this list, Agar is revealing his appreciation for God's unbelievable design when it comes to biology, <laughs> physics, human nature, an eagle in flight, how snakes slither, how boats float. Y'all, we think we are so smart because scientists today can come and say, oh, that's water displacement. We know the coalition of buoyancy, X over... Y'all, we're just discovering what God has already invented. He was the one who came up with it. That's his design. We just get to come along beside him with their magnifying glass and say, well, golly gee, look what he's done. And then we're so smart, we take credit for it. Say, like, oh, no, you did I did no, you didn't invent buoyancy. It's a law of physics. There's not 47 genders. There's two. God says it, male and female. Don't be confused about that. You don't have to be. Confusion comes from the enemy. He loves nothing more than to sow confusion. And people are confused about things they shouldn't be confused about. Again, people love to say it's science. It's biology. Last I looked, God invented science and biology and physics and all these things. And Agar is pointing out these things, and he's saying, guys, this points to a creator. God's design works, even if you don't understand it, even if you don't like it. His world, his rules. You don't like it? Go make your own world, right? I mean, this is what he's saying. We can trust what he's saying. He's not done. Look what he says next in list three. I call these the, the human mistakes. Verse 21. There are three things that make the earth tremble. Oh, boy. Nope, four, it can endure. A slave who becomes a king, an overbearing fool who prospers, what in the world? A bitter woman who finally gets a husband, this is so strange, and a servant girl who supplants her mistress. Agar, what are you talking about? Well, he's not talking literally about earthquakes in this moment, okay? I think we can understand that. He is talking about human mistakes that can cause your relationships to feel like they are on an earthquake. It could cause kingdoms to, to tremble and crumble to the ground. And he gives four very interesting examples. Look at the first one. This is when someone without experience, with no training, who has no business being in kingship, is given the kingship. Who has no business leading your people. Look at the next one. When a godless fool gets everything they want without earning their way. Ooh, y'all, we see this all the time with like lottery winners or Children of multi-millionaires and billionaires, and they die, and they suddenly inherit all this wealth, and they go bizarre, bonkers. They don't know what to do. It's even got a name. Y'all know that? Like, we talked about this a few years ago, sudden wealth syndrome. It's a legit thing. You can look it up. No, not now. You can look it up later. And see, this is a real thing. Another human mistake is when we get married against God's will. We get married for the wrong reasons. Anything other than godly love. This is great advice. He's saying, don't worry. You don't marry for money. You don't marry for lust. You don't marry to spite your parents or to escape home. Many of you believe that God has, this is why we, this is why you get married. I remember when I was talking to my mom, I said, mom, there's this girl named Amy. Mm. 
And I kind of like her. She gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling in my belly. <laughs> says, well, I just don't know. I mean, how do you know if this is the one I can live with the rest of my life? She says, oh, you missed it, son. Marry the one you know you can't live without. God put us together. And this is what he said, guys. When God brings you that complimentary person, and it's for godly love, and you sense his blessing, that is when you proceed. The last on his list deals the same thing with a little bit of this. This is the lust offshoot. A servant who displaces her mistress. A servant is right alongside the mistress. She's in the household. She's in the office building. She's working next to the man by the water cooler. That little innocent flirtation ain't so innocent. That opens doors, and it causes kingdoms and families to crumble. A servant snuck in there and displaced the wife. Y'all, men, women, this goes both ways. That innocent flirt, do not let it rock the foundation of your family, of your marriage. It will crumble. Agar is so wise. Why have we not heard about this guy? Look at list four. This is the one I call the small wonders. Verse 24, he says this. There's four things on earth that are small but unusually wise. Ants, they aren't strong, but they store up food all summer. Hyraxes, they aren't, pe those, those pesky hyraxes, right? Am I right? Huh? Y'all know what hyrax, don't you look like you know it there? Because I had to look it up. There you go, rock badgers, little fat, cuddly things. He goes on, there's something cool they do. They're not powerful, but they make their homes in these safe areas, in these crags among the rocks. Verse 27, locusts, they have no king. But they march in formation. Lizards, they're easy to catch, but they're everywhere. They're even found in king's palaces. So what in the world are we supposed to learn from this bizarre list? Well, the first thing I see right here, every one of them takes full advantage of the gifts their creator gave them. Boop. Think about it. Ants, they wisely store food for the winter. That sneaky hyrax, those hyrax, there they are again. These rock badgers, they hide in these hillside crags, and they're safe, even though they would be such easy pickings. These locusts, they have no leader, but they can spread terror, destruction, like these cicadas coming out. What? Look at number four, lizards. Why is he talking about this? Sneaky lizards, they go into castles, they're in wealthy places. What a great image. Can you imagine these stuffy guards in these palaces guarding the king? And they see a lizard sneak by, and they all run. They're bumping into each other, trying to get their armor, and they're trying to poke it with a spear, and like, they're trying to catch it. Think about this. What is Edgar talking about? Perhaps he's telling us not to take ourselves too seriously, not to panic, when minor details don't go our way. You know anybody like that? They have their plan, and the plan gets changed on them just a little bit, and they lose their mind. Confession. I used to be that guy. Ooh, buddy, don't you mess with my plan. <laughs> I worked hard on it. I stayed up all night on that plan. What do you mean we can't open presents before we open the stockings? I have this mapped out. This is, this is, think about what he's saying. He's saying we take ourselves too seriously. They're in palaces. Could it be the main lesson he's trying to say is God sees everything, the big, the small. He sees it all, and he cares about it all. Little things matter. The big picture, the smallest details of your life do not escape your creator's notice. And now we're to the final list. He gives us four more images of those who seemingly stand tall, but if you look close, they are on the danger of a precipice about to fall. And I call this the downfall of the kings. Look at verse 29. There's three things that walk with stately stride. Nope, four that strut about. The lion, the king of the animals, who won't turn aside for anything. The strutting rooster. Y'all, when I read that earlier this week, I had no clue what that meant. Until yesterday, when I went to the Barton's house. <laughs> they had a graduation party for Elias. Congrats, graduates. Congrats, everybody. I'm walking by the woods. They got a ninja course in the back, and I was going to go try my hand at that. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And I'm walking by, and there's this cage, but it's partially covered with trees and bushes. Don't think much about it. I'm bebopping back. I see some graduates. Hey, what's up, Right next to me. <laughs> Y'all, I jumped. 
I was so freaked out because I'm not, I'm not a farm guy. I mean, I am the epitome of a city boy. And I look, and there's this rooster eyeballing me. He's like, bah! and he goes again. I'm like, I intimidate him not at all. He is the epitome of a strutting rooster. I've never even seen one up close. That thing scares me. He's like, and like he was challenging me. Like he's walking. I go back. I do the ninja course. I take one look at it. Here's your story. I'm like, nope. And I walk away. Walk by. He's like still there. Checking me out. You know, he's. Now I understand scripture. The strutting rooster. He struts. Does he have a name? Is that one named? Geraldo. Okay. Here's to Geraldo who scared me. He goes on to say, a male goat, don't get that, a king as he leads his army. Verse 32, if you've been a fool by being proud or plotting evil, cover your mouth in shame. As the beating of cream yields butter and striking the nose causes bleeding. Just like that, stirring up anger causes quarrels. What a great reminder for us all. These earthly kingdoms, guys, they're not going to last forever. The lion, the rooster, mountain goat. Human kings, they may all think they're invincible. Geraldo sure does, but they're not. They're temporary. We all have finite time. No matter how powerful you are, when you exalt yourself, when you actively plan evil, when you stir up anger, strife is coming your way. Don't be surprised. When you gossip and you slander about people, don't be surprised when they hear about it and anger and strife fills your day. When you plot these things, you are not invincible. You will be overthrown. Like these kings, you will become off your throne. Right? So let's call this a warning against pride. Listen to what Agar's saying. Pride, good night. I'm so tired of hearing about pride this month. I'm seeing, st- guys, I love everybody, but I want you to hear Proverbs 16. Take the sexual stuff out of it and just look at what the word pride is defining. Proverbs 16 says, pride comes before destruction. Pride comes before a fall. You never see it listed as a good thing in any way. Be very careful what we normalize and celebrate when God's word is very clear. When we look at this, 2 Corinthians 10, 17 even goes, says, let the one who boasts, if you're bragging about anything, you brag about the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, period. That's the only place we're supposed to have pride. We should come before him with humble, on our faces before God. Thank God, woe is me, for I am a sinner. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and unclean hands. Just like we read about the prophets who had a chance to get in the Shekinah glory, going before the ark, and the cloud fills the temple so much they can't even minister, they have to stop. Because God is holy. And his standards haven't changed. They haven't changed. Culture can change. Culture can redefine whatever they want. I'm not going to be judged by culture. I'm going to be judged by God. And I want to be found a man blameless after his heart. And as believers in Christ, we all should. We all should want to adhere to a standard. This is why we need to know this book. So Agar's given us these five lists, man. There's so much wisdom here. Y'all, we are just scratching the surface. He is the ultimate authority. And Agar's list comes all together to one final point. This is our last takeaway. Anticipate God's eternity. This is what it's all driving to. This is the good part. This is for everybody. No matter where you stand politically, no matter where you stand sexually, no matter where you stand economically, racially, there is one race, the human race, and Jesus died to save it from sin. That includes all of us. No one's greater than another. No one's pointing fingers at anything other than a mirror saying we have all sinned and all have fallen short of God's glory. And if you accept that and you confess him as Lord and you agree with who he says he is, because he is the Lord, the creator, then you can have the Holy Spirit take up residence in your heart to seal you for that day of redemption that we've been talking about. Hopefully we can miss that death and we can just go be with the Lord. Let him come. Come, Lord Jesus. See, God is not surprised by our questions. He's not stumped. Ask. Seek. He invites it. The only God of any faith that says, come, come taste and see. All the other other gods say, come and die for me. And he says, you know what? I did that. I will die for you. I will take your sin and your shame, and I will put it on my blameless son, the sacrifice, and I will take your sin. So what do you think of Agar? 
What do you think of Agar so far? Here's what we're going to do, okay? We're, I'm out of time. We're going to end like this, okay? Guys, you can just stay where you are. I'm going I'm to pray for us. But I want you to, I, I gave you a challenge, okay? I love Agar. This is so good. Agar is the friend we all want. Do you notice that? He makes us laugh. He makes us cry. <laughs> he tells us as it is. Makes us think. He loves us. And I love it. He tells it, you know, as, as God gave it to him. And he gives us so many key takeaways, yet we haven't even gotten to the prayer yet. I told you not to read it. Now I am lifting the embargo, and I want you to read it. It's three verses. This is your challenge when you go. Proverbs 30, verses 7, 8, and 9, I believe. Read the prayer, and then we're going to discuss it Sunday. But if you can, read the whole verse, all the verses around, the whole chapter one more time before we get together, okay? You watching online as well. I want you to read this whole chapter in its context. Remember the lists. Remember the wisdom. Remember the things that he pointed out, some of the incredible truth. Of. And then there's this little prayer. I'm going to give you just a teaser before we pray. See if you can glean the meaning of a bizarre prayer that contains this. Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Wow. What is he praying? Why would he pray that? I want to remind you a couple things before we pray. If you're a follower of Christ and you've never made that public, you can do that. Next week, we're going to be baptizing. It's Father's Day. It's going to be a special day, and I can't tell you why, but you'll see first thing uh, next Sunday. We're going to finish the prayer of Agar. Will you tell me? Will you come up and let me know there's still time for you to be added to this? Other churches that we help that meet in this building, they're going to be baptized. They're going to use our, our baptistry as well. It's going to be a beautiful time. I love it. People coming together to, to worship God that may not be just like us. If you haven't followed in believer's baptism and you haven't publicly declared you are all in, you need to do that. Scripture says repent and be baptized. Jesus was baptized. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. It declares not only that you are all in, but it encourages the church when they see others. And we can come along and link arms and walk this road together. That's the 20th. The very next day, we have our eighth annual golf tournament. And this is going to be so, so awesome. I'm going to be there teaching how to golf. No, I'm not going to be teaching nothing. If you can still help, there are some options available. Well, you see Mr. Elliott right here on the front row. We still need some players. We have room for teams, a few volunteers. Uh, Kevin, I think Kevin's here as well. See Kevin Rogerson as well. All the proceeds are going to benefit missions, Potter's Hand missions and support military spouses. So uh, this is an awesome uh, charity thing we love to do each year. I don't even think we were able to do it last year, were we? Right? Maybe a little one, a kind of an kind of under-the-radar thing. But now we're back. That's awesome. Then... Four days later, Friday night, we have our family movie night. This one is going to have a kid's focus. This is going to be, we're going to show Shark Tale. Great, funny movie. I want you guys to support that if you can. See Miss Nancy. Let her know. I'm sure she would always love more volunteers. Going to have concessions. Everything's a dollar. Popcorn, I think, is even free. Great time to bring somebody, maybe an on-ramp event. Maybe they don't go to church anywhere, but they want to come. It's going to be here in this room. Going to be fun. It's going to, this one's instead of being for all the ages, going to be kind of tailored for the kids. So take advantage of that, mom and dad. All right, let's stand together. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to dismiss, and we're going to go read the prayer of Agar and find out what a hyrax is. All right, let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your word. It, it, I feel like a kid in a candy store when we get to see these truths, and it's just like I open the page, and oh, there's another one. Oh, look at that. God, thank you that you are so gracious to give us a book that is alive, that even though it never changes, it still can change us, and it still has truth. Lord, thank you for opening our eyes and our hearts for these ancient texts, 3,000 years old, and you make it so real, so relevant. Lord, I pray that it would be more than words, that as we leave this place today, we would practice truth, that we would show love, and we would also show truth. We would balance that sweet spot that you've called us to walk in, God. You are so good to us. Thank you for being merciful to us, for forgiving us of our sin when we repent and confess. Thank you, God. Thank you. Our hearts are grateful. We love you. I pray that that love shows this week as we leave in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen and amen.